Hi, my name is Ayat Shah Milahi, and the work that I'm about to present is a joint uh, work with a fellow researcher at Netflix, Eves Raymond, who is also here in the audience. And we're both part of the team, which is called as Algorithms Engineering, which is part of the product group. And um, the, uh, the topic of my presentation is the use of Spark and GraphX in solving different machine learning problems at Netflix. So machine learning at Net Netflix, I mean, uh, many researchers and practical machine learning uh, engineers, they, they have been interested in uh, applying machine learning techniques in, on the Netflix data set from the, right from the uh, Netflix competition, uh, where the goal was to predict the ratings accurately. And machine learning is one of the core part of the product, and the main goal of machine learning at Netflix is that it helps members find content that they'll enjoy to maximize satisfaction and therefore their retention. And as I mentioned that machine learning is a core part of the product, it's to the extent that every impression that you see on Netflix is actually a recommendation coming from one of our algorithms. So what are the key challenges in applying machine learning at Netflix? Well, one of the major challenges is scale. Uh, as you may know that Netflix is available in more than 50 countries. We have more than 62 million members now. They stream billions of hours of content every month and they use thousands of devices. So scale is a big challenge and that's where distributed machine learning comes and provides help and Spark and GraphX, that's where they can provide their value as well. Uh, just saying a couple of words about Spark and GraphX. Uh, Spark, in essence, it provides the ability to perform distributed in-memory computations using the distributed data structures called as RDDs. And GraphX on top of Spark extends those RDDs to multigraphs and it provides the ability to perform graph analytics. And GraphX to Spark is what Giraffe was to Hadoop. And both of these technologies, they're like far, they're open source exciting and uh, uh, they're very convenient to work with because you, can, you have tools like iSpark and Zeppelin which allow you to write prototype code and take it to production with relative ease. I'll be talking about two machine learning problems which are of interest beyond uh, recommendations. So one is generate ranking of items with respect to a given item from an interaction graph. And in particular, I'll be talking about graph diffusion algorithms and a particular example of graph diffusion algorithms, uh, topic sensitor page rank. Some people call it as the personalized page rank as well. And the second uh, machine learning algorithm I'll be talking about is um, to find clusters of related items using co-occurrence data. And uh, here I'll be talking about probabilistic graphical models, which is actually a very active area of research in Netflix. And a particular example of that, uh, a very popular one, latent Dirichlet allocation. So how do you represent iterative algorithms in GraphX? Let's say uh, your data is represented as a graph where you have some vertices which have some attributes or properties associated with, with, with those vertices called as vertex attributes. And then there are edges between those vertices uh, and there are properties associated with the edges as well encoding some form of relationship between vertices called as edge attributes. So GraphX lets you represent this graph as a distributed uh, graph using RDDs, which are called as vertex RDDs, edge RDDs, et cetera. And then it provides APIs and methods to propagate and uh, update these attributes. And that's what these iterative machine learning algorithms do. They update and propagate these uh, attributes in every iteration and create new graphs, and that's how they follow. And uh, we'll see a couple of examples of this sort in this presentation. So let's start with the graph diffusion algorithms. Uh, topic sensitive page rank, it's a popular uh, graph diffusion algorithm. It lets us capture the importance of all the vertices in a graph with respect to a particular vertex. Taking the example of the Netflix data set, uh, imagine that all the titles in Netflix and the tags and metadata associated with those titles, they form the vertices in a graph. And uh, the edges between those vertices, they capture the relationship of the titles with the metadata and also among the titles as well, like how frequently they are played together. So when you build such a graph and then you run topic sensitive page rank and make a query for the uh, tag Seattle, you would come up with a ranking which looks something like this. I mean, and it looks like a reasonable ranking for the tag Seattle because sleepless is Seattle, set in Seattle, killing is set in Seattle, Grey's Anatomy is set in Seattle, and Frazier as well. So it looks like a reasonable answer for Seattle. Taking this example a little, looking at this example in, in a little bit more detail, let's say your graph, uh, it has, so the tag Seattle is represented as a vertex, and also the titles which have some relationship with this tag and also among themselves as well, like those titles, they're also represented as vertices in this graph. 
and we want to run topic sensitive page rank by activating the node Seattle. How do you do that? Well, with some probability, we follow the outbound edges, and this probability is actually a parameter in the model, and or otherwise we stay at the origin. Uh, the vertex attributes in this graph are actually the activation probabilities of these nodes, uh, which basically mean that what is the probability of the node getting activated from any given starting node. And they are represented as by the strength of the colors of these nodes. And you apply this procedure for all the intermediate nodes as well, and then if you follow the math, you'll figure out that this node which is highlighted, it accumulates the highest activation probability because it is connected with three paths to the uh, starting node. And then you repeat this process until you reach some form of convergence. So what can GraphX provide for this kind of an algorithm? Well, let's say you want to generate these rankings for all the vertices in a, in a, in a graph, and as you can imagine easily, that running that one by one would be slow. So GraphX can provide you to run all these propagations in parallel. How do you do that? You would create a graph where the attributes associated with the vertex, um, they are not scalars, but rather a vector of probabilities, activation probabilities, where those activation probabilities, that vector basically encodes the probability of reaching that node from any node in the graph. And when you apply this algorithm on the Netflix data set, you come up with these nice examples where, for example, if you make a query for matrix, the ranking that you get over all the vertices looks something like this, which is very reasonable because matrix and movies which are similar to matrix, they are at the top of the ranking. If you make a query for the tag zombies, uh, it's not necessarily a movie, but a tag or some metadata thing, you get this ranking which is about like TV shows and movies which are, which are, which are about zombies. And then I already described the example for Seattle. Uh, so, so these are the kind of examples that you would get uh, by applying graph diffusion using GraphX on the Netflix problem, uh, Netflix data set. Now let's, moving, uh, let's move towards the distributed clustering algorithms. Um, LDA, it's a popular clustering latent factors model. And then when applied on the Netflix data set, it captures uh, clusters or topics of related videos. For example, when applied on a data set uh, from Netflix, which could be, be, which could be like the search, search, search history of users or highly rated items of users, you find out a topic of, about animal documentaries. Talking about the graphical model of LDA in a little bit more detail, um, the parameter beta k in this model, it's actually the, the, the kth topic. The parameter pi d is the, uh, the document to topic association for dth document. And the uh, parameter ZDW is the topic label for, w th for the word W in document D. So now the main question is how to parallelize inference for such, a, for such a model. And I'll be talking about distributed Gibbs sampling. Well, the answer is very simple. Just read conditional independencies in the model. And this is actually true for almost all graphical, for all graphical models. So let's try to do that. So, um, so given the fact that we know what our topics are, which are these beta case, um, the posterior sampling of topic labels across documents becomes conditionally independent. They are conditionally independent given these, uh, uh, given these topics. And you're left with two update equations for your Gibbs sampler. The first one lets you sample the, the topic labels uh, across documents in parallel, but in a given document in sequence. And then once you have sampled your topic labels, uh, it lets, the second uh, update equation lets you update your, the, 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 the topics. And as I described, this Gibbs sampler, I'll, I'm calling it a semi-collapsed Gibbs sampler because I have marginalized over the pi d parameter. It's not being sampled. It lets you sample topic labels in different documents in parallel, but within a given document, you have to do sampling in sequence. Now, taking this approach a little bit uh, further, so instead of, uh, in, in addition to beta k, which are the topics, let's sample the document to topic associations as well, which are pi d. Now, the posterior sampling of topic labels within a document also becomes decoupled. It's completely independent. And now you are left with three update equations for your Gibbs sampler. The first one lets you sample the topic labels in a given document in completely in parallel. And then once you have sampled your uh, topic labels, you can update your, uh, the document to topic association probabilities and also the topics as well. So as like I mean described, this lets you sample process different documents in, in parallel, and also you can sample topics within a document also in parallel. So this seems to be the right um, approach to follow for GraphX implementations because the topic sampling is a completely distributed procedure now. So this seems to be the suitable approach for GraphX. So how would you do that? Let's say your data set, you have represented that as a graph where the blue node represents the document and the gray node represents the world and the edge between 
the blue and the gray node represents if the word is present in the document. The vertex attribute for the blue node is the document to topic association, uh, pi d parameter. And the vertex attribute for the word nodes, they are the probability of observing that word given different, given all the topics. And just to point out that this column vector is not a probability distribution, rather the first row of all these three columns, they are the probability distribution, they are the topics. So given that you have that, in graphics, you call this tuple of vertex edge and vertex a triplet. So this triplet has all the information that you need to sample the topic for the word in that document. You take the parameters associated with the document and word for that triplet, and you construct the categorical distribution for that triplet. And then you do the, perform this categorical, construct this categorical distribution for all the triplets um, uh, in, your, in your graph in parallel. And you, then you sample your topics in parallel. And then after that, you perform neighborhood aggregation to aggregate, to construct the topic histograms. For example, for this first document, this number two basically says that we observe two labels of topic one um, in document D1. And the similarly, like you have counts for all the vertices. And in the next step, you realize samples from the traditional distribution for all of these uh, histograms, and your graph is now ready to perform the second iteration. So that's how you l run LDA on, um, in fully distributed mode on GraphX. And when you apply this on the Netflix data set, you come up with these nice looking topics of related content, which are very pleasing to look at because first of all, they reveal like, I mean, um, first of all, they're thematically very similar. And secondly, they reveal like how this content uh, co-occurs in the data set that you're considering. You have a cluster about Bollywood movies, you have a cluster about uh, kids content, and then you have, a you have a topic about Western movies. Now I'll be talking about how GraphX compares with other implementations, and this may be the most interesting for many people. So just to point out uh, the implementations that we have for this comparison, we have the topic sensitive page rank. So one implementation is the graphics implementation. The other implementation is a distributed multi-threaded implementation. Uh, it's a Scala Breeze code. Breeze is a linear algebra library in Scala, which is triggered by Spark. And for LDA, one implementation is GraphX, and the alternative implementation is a single machine, multi-threaded Java code. And all the implementations are Netflix internal code. Uh, we are only using GraphX and Spark uh, for, distribution, for distributed implementations. And this is how the compar performance comparison looks like. We performed experiment for both topic sensitive page rank and distributed GIP sampling, and I'll describe both of them one by one. The graph on the left. Uh, it's about uh, topics and sensitive page rank. Uh, we use the open source DBpedia dataset uh, for these experiments. The x-axis represents the number of vertices you propagated in parallel, and the y-axis represents the time uh, to make a certain number of iterations, and the number of iterations are fixed. Uh, we have two implementations being uh, compared here. One is the Spark uh, Breeze, uh, Scala Breeze implementation, and the other one is the GraphX implementation. And for both of these implementations, we have two versions. One is running on a cluster of uh, twice the size. For example, for GraphX, the blue curve is running on, uh, the, the orange curve is running on a cluster of twice the size. So a couple of interesting uh, observations we make from this graph. Uh, for GraphX, uh, with the number of vertices, you, saw, you see a sublinear rise in time, whereas in the alternative, alternative implementation, we see a linear rise in time. Uh, which means that there is a crossover point uh, in this graph after which the GraphX implementation is faster. We also observed that doubling the size of the cluster leads to a 2x speed up in the uh, alternative implementation because roughly the data is getting split in half for every, for every instance to process, whereas it leads to only 1.2x speed up in, in GraphX. And then when we try to uh, do uh, 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 when we try to perform uh, a large number of vertices, propagation in parallel, it leads to a large amount of shuffle data which causes failure in GraphX. For example, the smaller cluster failed when we per performed um, 10,000 vertices in parallel and the bigger cluster failed at 100,000 um, uh, vertices propagated in parallel, whereas the alternative implementation just keeps going. Now I'll talk about the uh, second uh, set of experiments which were about distributed GIP sampling for LDA. Uh, it's an internal Netflix data set. And the number of topics for this experiment were chosen to be 100. Um, the, num the x axis represents the number of edges because the runtime is proportional to the number of edges or the number of tokens you see in the, uh, you have in the data set. The y axis is time per iteration averaged over multiple iterations. 
And again, we have two implementations being compared here, one single machine, multi-threaded Java code, and the other one is uh, graphics implementation. And, uh, and in the single machine, multi-threaded Java code, we have two versions. One is the uncollapsed GIP sampler, which was the last one that I presented, and the uh, blue curve is the semi-collapsed GIP sampler. Just to point out that the graphics setup, it has eight times the resources of the multi-core setup. Um, just to give a sense of the scale of this graph, um, uh, Databricks performed some experiments with the Wikipedia data set, which had roughly 1.1 billion edges. Uh, they were using a cluster uh, of half the capacity of what I'm using here, and they reported times for up to like three minutes or something per iteration. Uh, and, and you can see, like, I mean, the experiments that we are performing, they are at least like five times bigger than those experiments. And again, you notice that GraphX for very large data sets, it does overtake the uh, multi-core uh, uncollapsed implementation, but that you can see that point li lies very far on the right, whereas the semi-collapsed implementation, which is actually uh, a better implementation approach for single machine um, algorithms because you have access to all the parameters which are available in memory. So, um, so that outperforms all these, all, both the implementations uh, throughout the entirety of the graph. Well. So what are the main lessons we learned uh, through these experiments? When you're using GraphX, it's very important that you determine where is the crossover point for your iterative machine learning algorithm, because only beyond that point, you'll see benefits from, from approaches like GraphX, uh, uh, platforms like GraphX. And then, and then we also found out that GraphX lets you throw more hardware at a problem, which leads to like roughly 1.2x speed ups in your uh, algorithms. Uh, beyond machine learning, GraphX is very useful for other uh, processing, graph processing tasks, tasks as well. For example, data pre-processing, it, it has very, very nice ability to perform efficient joins in your data set. Another important thing when you're writing iterative algorithms in using GraphX or any distributed uh, platform, if distributed uh, platforms, there, there, is an inherent, uh, uh, there is an inherent degree of failure. Even if you have a 99.9% .9 success, success rate to make a single iteration, what is the probability that you'll be able to make 1,000 iterations for your machine learning algorithm? Because 1,000 iterations are pretty common in GIP sampling and those kind of things. And you can guess, I mean, this is just applying a geometric distribution on the failure rate, that you'll only have a chance of 36% of successfully making 1,000 iterations. So it's extremely important to regularly save the state of uh, your iterative algorithm after small iterations. And then at the end, Multi-core machine learning, when you have machines available, uh, R3XL, which is an Amazon AWS instance, which lets you run 32 threads and which has 250, 220 gigs of memory, they are pretty efficient, uh, given the fact that you're able to store all your data in memory of a single machine. So these are the main learnings that we had from our experiments and working with graphics. And I hope you find uh, the experiments that we performed to be interesting. And if you like the kind of work that we mentioned here, so I would like to mention that we are hiring researchers and engineers who are interested in this sort of work. And come talk to us and, um, or go directly to jobs.netflix.com. And um, thank you so much.